Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to present our distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Richard Kaplan. Professor Kaplan is Professor of International Relations, and he's also a fellow at Lineker College and at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford. He has published extensively on his main research interests, which are conflict management and international organizations with a particular focus on peacekeeping and post-conflict uh, peace and, and state building. Um, among his uh, many books um, are, just to mention a few, uh, Europe's New Nationalism, States and Minority uh, in Conflict, published in 1996 with Oxford University Press. Um, another inter interesting book is In Trusteeship, the International Administration of War-Torn Territories, published in 2002. Uh, Europe and the Recognition of New States in Yugoslavia, published in 2005. Um, Exit Strategies and State Building, published with Oxford University Press 2012. And his most recent book uh, is called Measuring Peace, Principles, Practices and Politics, published with Oxford University Press last year, not 2019. Professor Kaplan is not only the principal investigator of one major research project, but of two major re research projects. Uh, that have been uh, that are funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. Uh, one uh, of the two projects is called After Exit, assessing the consequences of United Nations peacekeeping withdrawal. And it's basically the project that is investigating the situation on the ground in countries that have hosted UN large scale UN peacekeeping operations. And the second project uh, in which he is a principal investigator and a lead researcher um, is called Transboundary Resource Management. And that is basically a project that is exploring the scope for cross-border cooperation on nat natural resource management. And it deals both with the Eastern uh, Nile River Basin and the Jordan River Basin. Um, Professor Kaplan has held uh, different fellowships and he has received a large number of grants from the British Academy, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Economic and Social Research Co uh, Council. And if I mention them all, I will be talking for the rest of the evening. Uh, he had also very important visiting positions. And um, I'm very pleased that he accepted our invitation to give a talk on, I think for once, a positive topic related to the Middle East, right? At least <laughs> there's something, there's some hope here. Um, so he will be talking about uh, one of the two research projects I mentioned. And uh, the title of his talk is The Greening of Peace, Regional Cooperation on Climate Change in the Middle East. Professor Kaplan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for the invitation to join you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I only wish I could be with you actually, and I look forward to the opportunity to uh, do that again. I'm going to share my screen with you so that I can, is this the correct, or is this your image? No, this is good. We see that lines. That's perfect. Um, I'm not sure that it allows me to progress, however. If you give me just one moment, I want to make sure I haven't. Let's try this again. Okay, but I don't seem to be able to advance. No, that's actually the, um, the banner. Or the... No, but it's the same as yours. I've chosen your. And can you continue, can you move the slides? Or? I don't seem to be able to do that, which is very odd. Um, I'm sorry about this. If you give me just one moment. This is, this is why, okay. And uh, let me go to the beginning. That's why I was on the wrong. Let's see if this, actually, excellent. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I confused the, 
the slides. Anyway, again, thanks very much. And what I'm going to be talking to you about this evening uh, is indeed the one of the research projects that uh, Rafael has just been re referring to. It's a project that I'm undertaking, I've undertaken with colleagues from a wide range of disciplines, which is one of the more interesting aspects of this. It includes engineers, environmental scientists, political scientists, industry experts, um, community leaders, and, and diplomats. And the project is concerned with examining environmental pressures, climate change in particular, and their implications for the use and management of natural resources, but also uh, the implications for conflict mitigation. We're working in um, various uh, regions of, of the globe, uh, but tonight I'm going to be focusing on the work that we're doing uh, in the Lower Jordan River uh, Basin, which encompasses Israel, Palestine, and, and Jordan, um, which you will, of course, be <laughs> very familiar with. And um, there are, I guess, three research questions that animate this project. Um, the first uh, is what are the um, environmental stresses in this region and how are they affecting the use and availability of natural resources, water and energy in, in particular? That's one of our uh, central focus points. Um, secondly, can cross-border cooperation on natural resource management improve the availability and sustainability of natural resources? And third, can cross-border cooperation contribute to integration and even generate peace dividends? Now, what kinds of stresses are we talking about and what effects are they having? To begin with, Global warming is putting enormous pressures on fresh water supplies. The length of the dry summer season in the region is getting longer and the wet winter season is getting shorter, reducing the availability of fresh water in the region. The Eastern Mediterranean region has experienced drought conditions for 15 of the last 20 years. The population growth is only compounding the problem in 1948, Israel's population was uh, about 800,000. Now it's 8.7 million. Uh, Jordan's population then was 450,000. Now it's 10 million. And Gaza's population in 1948 was 60 to 80,000. Today it's roughly 2.1 million. So as I said, that's putting an enormous strain on water and on other natural resources. Now, whereas uh, both Israel and Gaza traditionally drew most of their water from the, the coastal aquifer. Overuse and mismanagement has rendered some 97% of that aquifer no longer potable, no longer drinkable. So Gazans live by filling uh, jerry cans with water from small desalination plants run by, by private vendors and international organizations. Uh, Jordan last year cut municipal water service from two days a week to eight hours a week for its residents. And uh, they have to buy the rest of their water from private vendors as well. Also, Jordan has had to absorb some one and a half million refugees from Syria's civil war, a war which was partly prompted by uh, drought itself. Now, desalination, desalination offers a, a partial solution, and Israel is very advanced in this regard. But because Gaza doesn't have sufficient sewage treatment facilities, roughly 100 million liters of raw sewage flows from Gaza every day into the Mediterranean. And the prevailing current takes it right up the coast, where Gaza's waste gets into the filters of Israel's big uh, desalination plant at Ashkelon, um, which as a result intermittently uh, has had to be shut down to be unclogged. Now, increased population growth has also meant increased energy demands, which has led to increased carbon emissions. Since 1990, Israel's reported greenhouse gas emissions have risen by 
78%. Jordan's greenhouse gas emissions have increased in that same period by 154%, and the Palestinian Authority by 515%. And you can see on the lower left of this slide a chart that depicts the increase in annual um, CO2 emissions from, from just Israel. Now, we are interested for purposes of this project of testing uh, two hypotheses, testing, seeing if there's enough evidence that will support the two hypotheses. Uh, the first is um, cross-border cooperation on resource management can lead to greater environmental and economic benefits than siloed approaches will, siloed being uh, unilateral self-contained efforts uh, to achieve the same. And the second hypothesis that we're seeking evidence for is whether cross-border cooperation can generate as well significant political and uh, security dividends. Now, I want to point out that we are not the first to propose regional cooperation over resources. Indeed, um, those of you who've studied uh, the peace treaties in the region will know that the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel signed in 1994, as well as the Oslo peace accords with Israel, with uh, Palestine and Israel in 1995, both contained provisions for regional cooperation over natural resources. And in fact, this is an excerpt, uh, this is Annex 6 of the Israeli-Palestinian Interim Agreement on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And you can see in point C, uh, the uh, language provision for promotion of uh, regional cooperation projects um, for mutual benefit in the field of, of electricity. Now, in addition to which, um, there have been other academic writings on this, and I can recommend the work of a leading environmental NGO in the region, EcoPeace, uh, which has uh, proposed also regional cooperation for uh, similar reasons. But I, I suppose what we offer in part uh, in this project is new data that confirms the benefits of regional cooperation and also the um, track to bottom up uh, approach that we're taking working with community leaders and also the diplomatic approaches that we're supporting, which I'll talk about in, um, in, a, in a few minutes. All right, in fact, um, I'll say a few words about our approach. Um, I suppose the other unique aspect of it is the modeling and forecasting that we're doing, which uses uh, what's called a, a system of systems model. It incorporates um, multiple uh, infrastructure and resource systems, their vulnerabilities, uh, availability, and use of resources together with um, environmental and developmental parameters. So it, it's quite a sophisticated model developed in Oxford to generate scenarios for how resources and infrastructures can be managed effectively in transboundary regions. Uh, the other thing we are doing is consulting with local stakeholders and local experts to gather and analyze data but also to develop proposals for new infrastructural and institutional arrangements, both large and small, to manage transboundary environmental pressure. So what we're not doing is devising uh, proposals here in Oxford that which we're then exporting, if you will, to the region. Everything that we're doing, we're doing in, in consultation with, um, with local stakeholders and, and experts. Uh, we're also working with former senior officials, both national and international, to promote regional cooperation over resource management. And we're also encouraging new ways of thinking, uh, in part about national security, that take account of the existential threats that environmental stresses pose, as well as uh, promoting uh, uh, the adoption of policies in the region that would lead to greater uh, regional cooperation over resource management. 
Now, I want to say a few words about um, the challenges that uh, the region is facing, and I'm going to focus on on energy, in the, in, given the limitations of time. We're also working on uh, water and water and energy and, and food security as well. But let me just say a few words about energy. Each party in the region faces three energy challenges. Energy security, that is reliable access to sufficient energy. Energy affordability, uh, that is reasonably priced energy and energy sustainability. That is energy that doesn't increase and ideally lowers uh, carbon emissions, <coughs> excuse me, as well as pollution in the region. Now, let me explain. Israel is increasing the reliant on natural gas, its own natural gas, which however, is vulnerable to both technical failure and military threats, disruptions. So for this reason, Israel's been seeking greater energy diversi diversification. Also, Israel is seeking to reduce its uh, carbon emissions, its greenhouse emissions, which can be achieved in part through an increase in the share of renewable energy that it produces, solar in particular for electricity purposes. It set a target of 30% renewables by uh, 2030, by the year 2030. But there are obstacles to the realization of this goal. Israel would need large tracts of land for the, the solar panels, um, estimated uh, 150 square kilometers in order to be able to reach that target. <coughs> and also extensive grid development, uh, as well as improved storage capacity because of excess solar generation during the day and insufficient solar generation, of course, in the evening. Now, Jordan's almost completely reliant on uh, energy imports. About 93% of his, its energy is imported. Previously, that was primarily coal and now increasingly natural gas. But those supplies, too, have been subject to serious disruption uh, in the past, when there was disorder in Egypt in 2011, for instance, it had uh, an effect on the availability, to, the, the pr provision of natural gas to, to Jordan. Jordan has since diversified, uh, uh, relying more on uh, liquid natural gas and oil shale and renewables, um, the latter through wind and solar. And Jordan is aiming for renewables to con constitute about 30% share <clears throat> of total energy by 2022. Now, Jordan suffers from some of the same logistical constraints that Israel does, which is to say uh, overproduction of solar energy during the day, insufficient during the, the evening. The problem with the West Bank is that it lacks both fuel resources and generation capacity. So it imports the vast majority of its electricity from Israel but the grid connection doesn't meet peak demand and also relations with Israel, of course, are fraught. Uh, now, Israel won't improve the grid connection partly because of a dispute over the debt which the Palestinian Authority owes to Israel over, over electricity. So locally generated solar and energy <clears throat> could play an important role in, in mitigating uh, Palestinian dependence on Israel, but <clears throat> that would require increased grid capacity and also access to Area C, the areas under Israeli military control in, uh, in the West Bank. And then finally, there's Gaza. Gaza is suffering from very severe uh, energy deficit. It relies on the diesel fuel Gaza, Gaza power plant, which is also highly polluting small local diesel generators, as well as some electricity imports from Egypt and electricity imports from, from Israel, which uh, taken together um, don't come anywhere near meeting Gaza's energy needs. Gaza gets uh, as little as 10 hours of electricity a day. And this severe lack of electricity remains a persistent and a critical humanitarian problem uh, disrupting the availability of, of vital services such as water, sanitation, hygiene, and, and health care. So these are the challenges, and there um, is considerable scope for 
cooperation among the parties that would allow them to, to meet these challenges. So just let's take first uh, Jordan, Israel. Uh, Jordan has land available for solar fields and importing uh, solar generated electricity from Jordan, if Israel were to do this, would certainly diversify Israel's electricity supply and enable Israel to achieve its renewable targets without having to build its own domestic capacity and also wouldn't require it to overcome the uh, problem that has of land shortage uh, for the solar panels. It would allow Jordan to dispose of excess solar generated electricity, <coughs> therefore obviating the need for um, either expensive storage facilities or for flexible generation. And cooperation would be facilitated by uh, seasonal complementarity. In other words, uh, Israel's peak needs are in the summer, uh, Jordan's are in the winter. You can actually see that depicted um, on the screen now. If you look at the first bar, uh, uh, in the case of Jordan in the winter, this is January, uh, the needs are high in Israel, they're not as high. Whereas if you look at uh, July and August, bars seven and eight, you'll see that Israel's needs are much higher at a time when uh, Jordan's needs are uh, much less. So there's there's seasonal com complementarity that can be uh, used to advantage of both parties. So um, Israel and the West Bank, um, cooperation between Israel and Palestine could take the form of an agreement to jointly develop solar resources, as I said, in, in Area C. Um, again, for Israel, the creation of additional generation capacity in Area C would ease the burden uh, that it has of providing sufficient renewable energy to meet its demand and its targets for lowering carbon emissions. For the, the Palestinian Authority, locally produced solar energy in Area C would reduce its dependence on Israel and energy sustainability would also be um, supported by diversifying as it, away from fossil fuels, which it relies on principally at the moment. Energy affordability would also be improved as the price of locally generated solar is far cheaper than imported power from, from Israel. And then finally, uh, Jordan and the West Bank. At present, there's very limited connection between uh, the two. Uh, there's a limited connection point that enables a, a small amount of electricity to flow from Jordan to Jericho. If there were greater coordination, it could be extended and deepened. Um, if Jordan and the Palestinian Authority were to increase the capacity of the grid that they operate on. And as with Israel, it would allow Jordan to dispose of the excess solar generated electricity that it produces during the day. Um, for the Palestinian Authority, the interconnection with, with Jordan would of course decrease energy dependence on, on Israel. So anyway, there's lots of potential gains from uh, from cooperation, and also the economic calculus works in favor of, of cooperation. The median price uh, for large non-residential solar installation for industrial in installation fell from $9 per uh, watt in 2000 to $2.40 in 2018. And in 2020, the price of uh, solar photovoltaic uh, energy was a uh, little more than $1 a watt. So the price has come down quite considerably, making it much, much more affordable. Now, I've only been talking about electricity. There's a similar story that can be told about water and about water and, and energy, um, where uh, uh, the evidence points towards um, cooperation for both um, environmental uh, energy and economic reasons. Um, and that's also part of the work that we're, we're doing. All right, so just to, um, to close on this, uh, let me uh, briefly say a few words about the uh, opportunities that this creates, uh, what, what could be constructive ways forward. Um, one is that uh, this points towards the need for new narratives on national security, uh, at least in the case of, of Israel, which um, 
curiously does not even have a national security uh, strategy. Um, it has a very traditional outlook on security for understandable reasons in view of, of, its, uh, of its history. Uh, but it is a view of security that does not take into consideration the threats to security that uh, are posed by environmental stress. And I want to just show you an excerpt from a, a forthcoming um, article that's appearing in a volume to be published by the Israel National Security um, uh, center, the um, Institute for National Security Studies, the INSS. Um, this is a one of the leading institutes in, in Israel, as uh, many of you may know. And this is a an article that's been authored by um, Michael uh, Mike Herzog, the former uh, head of uh, military intelligence uh, in Israel, uh, Raith Alamari, one of the chief advisors to the uh, Palestinians in their negotiations with, with Israel. And I'll just read what it says. Without intervention, the alarming threats of rising temperatures, mismanagement of dwindling natural resources, and interdependent water, energy, and food resources can lead to insecurities and health pandemics, along with surges of refugees, civil unrest, and an increased risk of internal or external war, all of which we're seeing actually already. And so the hope is that uh, this project, but not this project alone, will encourage uh, officials throughout the region uh, to gain a greater appreciation of the importance of energy um, security and energy sustainability, how they could um, uh, contribute to an enhancement of, of security. So that's one of the things that we're working towards a, a broadening, if you will, of the view of what national security means. Um, another uh, thing we hope to be able to achieve is uh, promoting joint discussion among Israel, the Palestinian Authority and Jordan on respective future energy plans. As you saw in that excerpt from the interim agreement, agreement with uh, Palestine Israel, and as is also reflected in the terms of the treaty with between Israel and Jordan, this is already something that was envisioned. Uh, so it, it really isn't something that uh, should be thought to be too ambitious. Um, in the same spirit, uh, we're hoping that uh, we'll see as a consequence of uh, the diffusion of these findings, support for local renewable energy projects, um, either small scale solar projects in Area C uh, to build trust and serve as the basis for larger and more tangibly impactful projects. Um, also joint research and development in the energy sector. And um, finally, uh, it is conceivable that the normalization accords, the so-called Abraham Accords that we've seen between the Gulf states and Israel uh, could open up possibilities for uh, investment in energy infrastructure in the region that would also contribute to regional cooperation. Uh, there is good sound economic reasons for uh, such investment. In other words, uh, uh, this is not just a matter of, of aid, but one could expect uh, a reasonable return on, on investment. And uh, it's also uh, conceivable, this was a, something which uh, Dennis Ross, the former uh, uh, mediator, U.S. mediator uh, in the region had proposed, which is that uh, Gulf states could uh, use or be encouraged to use investment um, as a form also of conditionality to encourage uh, greater integration, uh, put pressure, especially on Israel to uh, consider greater integration with, um, Israel, with Palestine and, and Jordan. Uh, so uh, as I said, that's um, just an overview of the research that we're, we're doing and um, with a focus on energy, but as I said, that there is um, a lot of work that we're also doing in the area of water and the water energy nexus and um, subsequently food security as well. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Richard. Um, this, this is a very fascinating project, and I'm really happy. To, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hear more as the project proceeds. Um, I'd like to open the floor for all of the, all of you connected uh, online. Please use the Q and A function, and for those present, please raise your voice. <laughs> um, anyone wanting to go first? Well, then I will. I will. <laughs> I also have questions for the audience, if I may be permitted. <laughs> I will just use my uh, my position. Um, I was just uh, what you were talking about, particularly on the water issue, uh, very much reminded me of the of the Oslo period, where there were very frequent. I mean, there were a lot of projects among Israel and the Palestinians, but also sometimes um, with Jordan on cooperation on water management. And I remember one project was the Dead Sea, Red Sea Canal, which I'm not sure uh, still exists as a project. But there were, of course, many other projects and, and um, experts sitting together and discussing um, cooperation, particularly on water issues. And uh, so I was just wondering, I mean, something obviously got in between those great projects that were there um, during Oslo, and so I'm just wondering, when you're talking to the, with stakeholders or with, with uh, former diplomats, uh, civil society from the different parties, um, what's what's the feedback that you get? I mean, isn't it isn't the problem that somehow politics get into the way of these um, very important um, projects on cooperating on on natural resources? Absolutely. Um... Each of the projects that you've mentioned, and as I said, I haven't really talked about water, but uh, these have been envisioned before. Um, politics has certainly been often one reason why uh, there have been impediments to moving forward, um, different political issues depending on uh, the relationship, um, Israel-Palestine, um, Israel-Jordan. Um, but they're all in some ways still viable and perhaps even more so, again, because of the, uh, the cost of the technology involved having come down. Now, um, one thought, for instance, is um, to build another desalination plant along the coast in Israel and um, to use that to bring water across the north. Um, it's thought actually would be less expensive than uh, the project that was envisioned for the Red Sea Dead Sea, um, although that is still in some ways um, viable as, as well, but probably more costly. But the idea too was that uh, you could use the transport of water as a way of generating electricity. So it would both be uh, in, increasing the uh, availability of fresh water, treated fresh water, uh, as as well as um, electricity generated by um, uh, turbines of um, associated with the the flow of the the water. But um, and we would have to look at each project one by one to identify, if you will, the obstacles that have prevented them from. Um, going forward. But I think it's fair to say that the optimism that was present at that time with with Oslo uh, evaporated. And uh, there simply hasn't been the same expectation that the uh, cooperation that it was hoped could be achieved um, would be achieved at this time. But I, I think, again, because of uh, the threats, the recognition, the increasing recognition uh, in Israel, especially. I mean, Israel has experienced um, the, some of the hottest summers uh, on record. Um, there have also been other extreme weather events, flooding in Tel Aviv. And I think that the public generally is waking up to the fact that uh, it has to take uh, significant measures to reduce the environmental threats and that uh, that may, as I said, create opportunities to revisit uh, ideas that uh, 
uh, were thought to be uh, viable at the time of Oslo. So please use the Q&A function, not the chat. I see that Laura uh, had a question, but she typed it into the chat. Please type it into the Q&A, please. And while you're doing that, I just continue. <laughs> I see one question from uh, Laura. Yes, um, that's in the chat, yeah. That's in the chat. Shall I read that or would she like to uh, ask that question? Yeah, I'll read it. So thank you, very, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm curious to know if you think that the EU might include climate security policies towards um, the Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, well, yes. Um, this is perfectly consistent with um, the EU's own uh, policies towards the region. And um, I had mentioned that there's, a, if you will, a diplomatic component to the work that we're doing. Um, I mentioned Dennis Ross, he's actually one of the individuals who's in, involved. Uh, we're also working um, or working with us on this is also uh, Mark Ott, who is the former EU special envoy for uh, the region. And uh, the, um, the thinking is that uh, th this uh, is, as I said, really very consistent with the EU's priorities for the region, which both uh, stability, working towards a more stable region, working towards um, mitigation and resolution of conflict in the region, and also um, working to uh, help the uh, countries in the region to achieve um, th their targets, their various um, environmental targets, um, whether it's for a reduction of greenhouse emissions or uh, other targets. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, we're hoping that um, this is something that the uh, EU will um, be interested possibly even in, in, in supporting once we are at a point where we have uh, uh, proposals that, uh, you know, for instance, for in infrastructure development, something which in the past the EU has uh, been happy to support. Thank you. Um, one question from David Tabarelli um, asking, is it possible to know the electricity prices in Israel and those applied in Gaza? Uh, so I don't have that information and I should have made clear from the outset that uh, this is not my area of expertise. One of the virtues of working with such a diverse team of experts as as I've been is that I can rely on others uh, for that kind of technical information. We've been very fortunate to have on our team uh, the uh, deputy head of the Israeli Electricity uh, Board uh, for a period of time. Uh, she's now left to take up a, um, a, a position in, in industry. But uh, she was able to provide us with uh, the kind of information that David is, is interested in. And the other thing I should say, which was a bit of an eye opener for me, was that um, she, despite the, the uh, access that she has to information and to data, she had very little knowledge of um, uh, energy uh, use consumption in the West Bank, for instance, and there was very, there was there was no formal uh, exchange of data uh, with the Palestinian Authority, and so um, as a result of this project, where Palestinians, Jordanians, and Israelis are working together, uh, uh, she who led on the that aspect of the analysis uh, was able to uh, obtain information, obtain data uh, that in her former position um, with the Israeli Electricity Board, uh, she didn't have. Uh, so this is, a, I think, another strength of the, uh, the, the project that it's been able successfully to bring together experts from across the region. Well, there is another question from uh, Charlie Laurie, um, actually, Double question. 
So first, what are, <clears throat> what are the precise ways in which new narratives are forged around energy cooperation? Which actors, institutions, and methods do you see being involved? And the second question is, do you see any risk that Israeli security imperatives continue to trump Palestinian energy independence? I'll start with the second question. Yes, um, there's always the risk uh, that uh, security imperatives uh, will uh, trump uh, any other considerations. And um, I guess th the opportunity that we see uh, for cooperation, for integration is a threat to others, as you can well imagine, uh, in the region for those who wish to inhibit any moves toward integration, towards uh, greater cooperation, for those who want to uh, ensure that um, measures are not taking that might facilitate um, greater uh, Palestinian independence, whether by that I mean uh, formal or informal independence, because one of the things which I said, the um, uh, development of solar uh, energy in the region, solar panels in the region, is that it would allow um, uh, Palestine to diversify and to um, become more independent of Israel for the provision of, of energy. And some will no doubt think that that is unwise, that it's uh, better if uh, uh, Israel is able to exert uh, control this way and as well as other ways over, over Palestine. So yes, there is a real risk um, that uh, uh, the, the, the security considerations as, or political considerations, depending on how you want to put it, are going to be paramount. Now, in terms of new notions of uh, security, again, by that I really mean just a, a broadening. And this is something that um, is not new. Um, I think it was uh, Jessica Matthews, the former president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, who wrote uh, this trailblazing article in Foreign Affairs um, before the turn of the century on uh, redefining security. And it was an uh, attempt to draw attention to the security implications, the implications for national security of rising environmental threats. And that's really what we are um, trying to do as well with this project. And I, I think that um, it, it became apparent also with um, the pandemic uh, in the last year um, th that uh, what I said was, you know, a siloed approach to national security was untenable because obviously these problems, these threats know no borders. Uh, infectious disease no, knows no borders. Uh, and so unless there is cooperation, the likelihood of being able to address these problems, these challenges, these threats uh, sufficiently uh, is is much less. And what was encouraging was that in the early days of the pandemic in, in March, there was actually um, more cooperation between Palestinians and Israelis uh, than there had been previously. I mean, obviously, relations have been very fraught in this period, but there was a lowering, if you will, of the temperature uh, initially. Uh, there have been uh, further problems over the vaccination campaign, I am, I am aware, but uh, there was at least a recognition that, you know, even adversaries could overcome their differences when there was recognition of a, a common threat. So I think that that's encouraging. I don't want to be Pollyannish about this. I mean, I don't want to uh, suggest that um, there's a new dawning um, uh, on the horizon, uh, but I, I just think that as evidence of the threat becomes more and more manifest, uh, that there's going to be a, a greater willingness um, on the part of the populations and the, the leadership uh, to um, consider working together more closely, more effectively. I mean, 
any other questions from the, perhaps you need some more time to formulate the questions. Um, I have one, as I said, Rafaela, for the audience. <laughs> and I was just wondering if I could throw one in their direction. I mentioned at the end, um, these normalization accords between the Gulf states and Israel. And I recognize that these are viewed um, very differently, um, different perspectives on, on these. Um, some of them see uh, this as um, a, well, a, a negative turning point, uh, an abandonment by the Gulf states of um, the, the Palestinian cause, if you will, the Palestinian issue, a downgrading of it. Um, but others uh, have talked about possible opportunity inherent in it. And I alluded to that a little bit in, in the end of my remarks. I, I said that one of the things certainly that Gulf states are seeking are greater investment opportunities. And it's interesting, um, I'm, I'm sure many people will be aware that um, there was discussion and perhaps by now already flights, regular flights between Israel and the Gulf states. Uh, the interesting thing is the Gulf states wanted many, many more flights between the two countries um, or between the two regions. And it was uh, Israel uh, that suggested that they, uh, which it's already quite significant. I can't remember how many there are over the course of a week, but there are a very significant number already. And it was Israel that sort of put the brakes on on, on that. And I, I think um, the Gulf states see opportunities for investment. They see opportunities for collaboration. And it has been suggested that, you know, maybe, uh, obviously this is something of interest to Israel as well. Maybe this can be turned um, to the advantage of the promotion of peace in the region rather than seeing it as an abandonment. As I said, maybe, um, uh, uh, investment can be tied uh, to progress towards um, greater integration and, and cooperation. Um, would Gulf states be willing to uh, um, accept that or, or put forward those conditions? Um, I mean, they might if they were concerned about losing face maybe in the region because of um, concessions to uh, to Israel, um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, countries where the public has the um, uh, Arab states where the, the public has been very unhappy with this rapprochement. So anyway, I just wondered what people thought about that prospect, about um, seeing this as a very dynamic process between Israel and the Gulf states and whether there is scope for uh, the use of conditionality here that could work in support of, um, as I said, conflict uh, mitigation, conflict uh, resolution, where ultimately it would lead is another question, uh, but to some improvement, if you will, um, in relations, especially between Israel and Palestine. If, <laughs> if anyone has any thoughts at all on that, I'd be very interested. Uh, um, I, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, I don't think it's their priority at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, but that's just my personal opinion, seeing how things are uh, developing, uh, especially because it seems like no one cares about the Palestinians anymore. Um, so I don't see it, uh, I, my point of view, is slightly more pessimistic. Okay, understandable. Emma, you want to... No, no opinion. <laughs> no, nobody wants to express him or herself. <laughs> All right. But we do have, I mean, I have a personal opinion as well. <laughs> um, I think the problem is really that um, the problem is not cooperation per se. I mean, the problem is, is um, uh, will there be a peace agreement or not? Because cooperation very much depends on that. No? Mm -hmm. And I think that the Oslo process tried to uh, try the opposite. I mean, in a way, the whole idea was to postpone the tricky issues to the end. 
But what it actually meant is that there was a lot of cooperation without having an end to the conflict and without having a peace agreement and without ending Israel's control over the Palestinians, right? So I'm not sure that um, that cooperation per se is a problem. I mean, I think you're right in saying that the pressures, the environmental pressures will certainly increase and that may force actually uh, the different sides to cooperate. But there are also very specific um, types of, of dependencies, um, yeah. right? And I think that that is that that then becomes a political problem where you have to find a solution to the conflict in order to then start with cooperation and uh, confidence building and so on and so on. That's my personal opinion. And from this point of view, I don't think that the um, normalization deals will uh, change much. I mean, it, it, it's it's true that in order for for the the Gulf states in particular, in order to, to somehow ad, uh, adjust themselves, right? Because they have been obviously criticized for completely mm-hmm. stopping the rise of the Palestinian, that they could say, okay, we invest and perhaps put some conditions to this type of investment. That could be a way ahead, but I'm not sure that, but again, that's my personal opinion. So I tend to be as pessimistic as Sarah. <laughs> no, but I can see why one would be. <laughs> well, it's very easy to be pessimistic regarding the Middle East, isn't it? But, yeah. Absolutely. So we have some more questions here from the from our online audience. So one is from Mark uh, Cotadellas Mancini, and he writes: Israel is the only state in the Jordan River Basin that has not joined the UN Water Courses Convention. Do you think that Israel's accession to the convention is indispensable to finding a peaceful and sustainable solution to the management of water resources in the region? And how likely is it, in your opinion? that Israel will join the convention in the near future. Okay, well, I, I think the person asking the question is more expert than I am on these matters. <laughs> uh, I can't really speak to that uh, at, specifically. I, I simply don't um, have expertise in that, uh, in that area. And I don't know, uh, you know what the consequences are are of Israel not joining and the likelihood of Israel joining, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm very happy to follow up with my colleagues on that point, but I'm afraid I I wouldn't be able to offer an informed opinion at this time. Mm -hmm. Going back to the discussion, to your question actually on the the, the Gulf states, there are uh, two comments, two positions from the online audience. So Charlie Laurie writes, on the subject of whether investment leads to peace, I'd echo Karl Polyani's criticism of the long 19th century peace. Supposedly, peace during the 19th century was enabled by international capital's demand for stability before World War I. That's to say that peace might emerge in the short term from investment, but in the long run, the contradictions may very well re-emerge. So that is the, uh, through the question on on the normalization. And David Tabarellis uh, writes, Gulf states are more pragmatic recently and they want, to make, they want to make business, big steps towards a more stable peace, still distant. Meaningful mm-hmm. the case of Neom, the new dream city of uh, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, a few miles from the Israeli border. Okay, so that's to the question that you threw in. Uh, yes, right? yes. And then we have another question, actually, that is a bit on it. Uh, let's see. Um, yes, another question um, to your presentation more generally is uh, from Jared Amberger uh, asking, what considerations are being taken in this project in ensuring a balanced approach to energy development in the region, specifically in regards to Israel and Palestine, as well as Jordan? Cooperation is ideal, but do you see an, an imbalance in foreign investments when it comes to the region? Well, I think that is a risk uh, because I think that uh, Israel is uh, a more attractive destination in some respects for investments. Um, the uh, more attractive than um, certainly. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, and and even for that matter, uh, Jordan. But going back to what I said earlier, I think that what's encouraging is that the kinds of 
uh, schemes that we're talking about. And, and incidentally, they can be very small scale and then scaled up. Uh, but I, I think that uh, they are, um, the, uh, they offer a, a, a sound return on, on investment. And uh, among diplomats in the region anyway, with whom I've spoken, they seem to feel, you know, there's also a, a political dimension to investment. And they, and again, they seem to feel that it may be possible uh, to persuade uh, countries in the region to target their investments in such a way that the, uh, the political and um, security and peace dividends are, are generated. Uh, but no, I, I uh, ag agree. I mean, even just take what I was saying earlier about um, uh, desalination. I mean, almost anything uh, that any major infrastructure project in, in Israel would be in this area, in the area of energy, I think would uh, be certain to attract uh, uh, investment from not only the region, but uh, internationally and for that matter, domestically. And I think that it's a lot more difficult for um, Jordan and the PA uh, to attract that kind of dimension. But I, I don't know that that's necessarily a problem. I mean, really, it depends on the nature of the project uh, and whether the benefits that would flow from it would be um, shared through the, the region and, and, and what would be, in other words, the, um, the, the broad effects of any of the investments that we're talking about. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that unequal investment would necessarily be a problem. So I'll ask another question in the time. <laughs> Hope someone else will provide um, their questions online. Um, I was wondering when you when you talked about the energy, the dependence, Israel's dependence of, um, from energy imports, and I was just wondering whether the equation has actually changed with the discovery of these large gas fields in the Eastern Mediterranean, right? I mean, uh, Israeli uh, Israel dependence from energy imports seems to be resolved, if not now, then at least in the short or in the medium run, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that the natural gas reserves off the coast of Israel have made a huge difference, and they haven't been fully exploited either, meaning uh, there are... Uh, there are reserves um, um, that Israel can uh, uh, exploit for for years to uh, for years to come. Um, prior to that, Israel was dependent on natural gas flowing from Egypt, uh, and that's where there was some vulnerability. But I think the issue isn't just the uh, availability. Um, it's also, well, reliability. And as I said, there are or can be technical difficulties, uh, which at least energy experts in the region uh, are concerned about with the delivery of uh, natural gas um, uh, to Israel, even its own natural gas. Um, and the other thing, of course, as I said, is the, um, the meeting of uh, its targets for carbon emissions, for um, uh, greenhouse gases. And with natural gas, uh, there's a risk of um, escape of methane, uh, very significant. And so if Israel, and it's interesting, Israel has become more ambitious about uh, its target. It had a lower target. I can't remember exactly uh, what it was, 22%, perhaps I can't recall exactly, uh, but it increased its target to 30% of renewables, not just solar, but also wind. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's not just a matter of, um, uh, uh, independence, energy independence, but also um, a, a matter of sustainability, uh, by which I mean uh, the eff effects that it's having uh, on the environment, maybe not necessarily locally, uh, but globally, and globally affects um, uh, Israel as, as well as other countries um, in the region. So I, I think that that's a very uh, clear priority on the part of the of the country. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Not on the Q and A either. I think it has been a long day for most of our students. Um, 
talk. So, uh, Richard, um, let me thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's a fascinating project, and I certainly look forward uh, to hearing more about it once you have perhaps, um, you know, once you publish perhaps also the discussions with the stakeholders or, um, or the modeling, and um, I very much look forward to that. Well, let me thank you for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure, uh, and I look forward to coming back to uh, SAIS. Yes. Always a pleasure. And hopefully in person, <laughs> which is always much nicer, right? Good. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Close this one.